well. Um, well, welcome. Um, sorry about any confusion on uh, this this uh, event, but we're we're having it, and uh, um, uh, we're gonna you know we'll, we'll share it for those that miss it. But um, this is our faculty corner, and um, we do these once a month, and it's a chance just to get to know our faculty. And um, even when you are in a class with a professor, you often sort of have a tunnel vision on the topic matter um, and moving through. And um, so this is an opportunity just to hear uh, the, the story of uh, our, our ethics professor, Dr. Barnes, and kind of just hear where he comes from and um, what has shaped him. And then uh, once he's taken some time to share, we'll have a open Q&A. Uh, we'll try and pull questions that got submitted online, and um, uh, you know, you gents can have uh, free reign on asking questions. Um, but we'll get to that. Um, but Dr. Barnes, take it away. Um, it's time's for you. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's it's nice to be here, and it's nice to meet you, folks. And uh, so let me let me just uh, start by telling you uh, one of the reasons I became a, uh, what we'll call a Bible-believing Christian. I was raised in a Roman Catholic household, uh, and I learned all the stories of Jesus in that context, and I'm very grateful and very thankful for that context. Uh, but, but really, my personal uh, commitment to the Lord um, was largely the result of, um, of me going on a, uh, a camping trip with a Presbyterian church when I was 12 years old. And my main motivation for going on that camping trip was Priscilla Pierce. Priscilla Pierce was the prettiest girl in the seventh grade. And she was going on that camping trip. So I was a Presbyterian for the weekend. And I went on that camping trip. And uh, somehow I came back from that camping trip without Priscilla Pierce, but with a Bible. So. That was, at the time, I thought I had taken second place, but turns out I took first place by coming back with that, that Bible. And, uh, and I read it. I read it ferociously. I, I, I read it every night. By the way, good news Bible. So for those of us who are biblical snobs, uh, not the greatest translation out there, uh, but you know what? For a 13-year-old kid, great translation. Uh, because it was very accessible. And we have to remember that. Scripture is meant to be accessible. And I just basically fell in love with Jesus and really gave my life to the Lord at, at 13 years old. And then uh, for you know, the rest of my adolescent life, uh, continued to practice as a Roman Catholic, met a nice Presbyterian girl in college. And when we got married, I double dipped. Uh, I would go to Catholic mass usually on Saturday night, because that was allowed. Uh, and then I would go to virtually all day church on, uh, on Sundays um, because that, you know, we, we were going to a reformed church. It wasn't strictly Presbyterian, but same ilk Calvinist uh, church uh, on Long Island. And did that for quite a while. And, and finally one day I, uh, I went to the priest and I went into the confessional because when you're raised Roman Catholic, that's when you speak to a priest. The priest is someone that you don't really approach very often, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. But when you're in the confessional, it's one-on-one. -on -one. So I went into the confessional because I didn't know what else to do. By now, I was married, early 20s, uh, had, had our first child. And I said, Father, I, I need your help. I, I said, I'm really struggling here. I, I, I said, I, I, I've been a devout Catholic my whole life. But I've also been a devout reader of the Bible. And, you know, my, my wife is, is Protestant and you got to help me here. And he, he basically read me the riot act. I mean, he just went up my left side and down my right side. How dare you question? And when he was done, I, I just said to him, thank you, Father. You answered the question for me. Uh, and, and from that point on, I, I just counted myself, as it were, uh, a, a proper Protestant, because my theology really, really was something that evolved out of my reading of Scripture. And so 
after a few years, um, I started to really feel God calling me to deepen my faith uh, in a more intellectual way as well. Now, understand that I was uh, already uh, a pretty accomplished business person. And it was clear that if I wanted a career in business, I could have it and I would be very successful. And so at this point, now I'm in my mid 20s, late 20s. Now I have uh, a second child uh, and soon a third on the way. As I felt God calling me to ministry, I had to figure out how I was going to do it. Uh, because I couldn't just walk away from my obligation. So uh, I went to Gordon Conwell and I was living in married student housing. I, I was telling the story earlier for the people who were on the call early. I was living in building D, which was brand new then, 35 years ago. And I was still working full time. And so it was interesting. My 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 theological education was going this way and my my secular career was going this way. They were both going up, but not necessarily going up in the same direction. And in those days, on the Academic Affairs Committee, there was a student rep. There is not now. I don't know why. There should be. Um, maybe some of you will come to Gordon Conwell and protest that there's no student rep on the Academic Affairs Committee. But I was the student rep on the Academic Affairs Committee. And I said to the professors in this meeting, I said, look, I take every single class at night because I work all day. So if you don't offer the biblical languages at night, people such as I are gonna have a problem graduating. And so Dr. Gary Pratico, uh, the most wonderful man, the Velvet Hammer, they called him, uh, who was, who was uh, teaching Hebrew at the time. He said, I'll try it for a semester and we'll see if it works. And thankfully, it's been going ever since. So I'm happy to say I was one of the pioneers for mature students. Uh, and when I graduated from Gordon Conwell, and then I spent a year at my denominational seminary at New Brunswick, and then became ordained, I originally thought that I would leave the corporate world behind and just sort of be a country parson, you know, somewhere in some nice New England town or something. But God had a very different idea. And a Jewish friend once said to me, Kenny, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And that's really what happened. Um, God had very different plans. And so for the next 25 years, I continued to combine three careers. I was an international, very senior business person. I did business all over the world, very high level. Um, and I was serving a church in Oxfordshire, uh, England, because being an international guy, I was based in the UK, because then you could get anywhere you had to get to. And continued to do my academic work. I ended up with, you know, five degrees. Um, and for most of those 25 years, those three worlds really didn't come together. It was almost like I, I had three, you know, parallel careers instead of one. And then one day I was confronted with a serious ethical dilemma at work. And I won't give you the details. It's not important. But suffice to say, I was asked to do something that I didn't think was ethical. And let me say it was perfectly legal. I want to say that again. It was perfectly legal what I was being asked to do. But I didn't believe it was ethical. And this is an important distinction. There is a very pernicious belief among a lot of Christian business people that as long as you're on the right side of the law, you're on the right side of God. And that is wrong. Uh, and so I went home one day and I said to my wife, this is soul destroying. I don't think I can do this anymore. And understand, I was at the height of my powers in the corporate world, uh, running a very big business and stock options and the whole bit. 
But at that point, I began to extricate myself from the corporate world and really made a concerted effort to bring my three worlds together. How could I be one Reverend Dr. Barnes who also understood the intricacies of the corner office? And that's when I went to Oxford. And in Oxford, I had several jobs, which is unusual in a place like Oxford. Usually people are very, very focused. But I had several jobs. One of them was I was a chaplain. I was a chaplain to American graduate students, Rhodes Scholars and others who were students because I knew that I wanted to get alongside the next generation of thought leaders who were coming through this globally influential university. And then in addition to that, I also taught in the business school and taught theology. Very few people at Oxford, I can think of two of us, taught in the business school and taught theology. And the other one happened to be uh, the Dean of Christ Church Cathedral. We were the two who combined business and theology. And that's when everything really started to come together. And then the market crashed in 2008. And guess what happened? My phone started to ring. I started being contacted by people all over the world saying, there are a lot of theologians speaking into this space. There are a lot of business people speaking into this space. There aren't very many people who have done both who can speak into this space. Because if you're just a theologian and you've never run a business, you don't quite have the, the, the cachet, if you will, the gravitas with people who have run businesses than someone who, who has. So that's when it started to get really interesting. Uh, then in 2013, I was invited to start a think tank in uh, Melbourne, Australia at Ridley Theological College. And that think tank was modeled on the Machla Center, even though I had no association with the Machla Center. The Machla Center came well after I graduated from Gordon Conway. But I knew David Gill, my predecessor, and I knew what the Machla Center was doing. So I, I created this think tank, this what was called the Marketplace Institute in Melbourne, Australia. And I spent three years commuting back and forth between Oxford, England and Melbourne, Australia, something I don't recommend. But I did that for three years. And then guess what? I got an email from my friend Miroslav Wolf at Yale. And he said, hey, your alma mater, Gordon Conwell, David Gill is retiring. They're looking for someone to replace him in case you're interested in going back to America. And as the Lord would have it, all three of my grown children who had grown up in England primarily uh, and graduated from school in England, in those three years that I was commuting back and forth between Oxford and Australia, all three of them moved back to America. And I said to my wife, I think God might be calling us back to Gordon Conwell after all those years away. And so since uh, June of 2016, I've been the Mockler Phillips Professor of Business Ethics uh, and Theology of Work at Gordon Comal. And I run the Mockler Center, which we recently renamed the Mockler Center for Faith and Ethics in the Public Square. And the reason for that is during COVID, it became quite obvious that the issues we were discussing, the ethical issues, that we were discussing at the Mockler Center were applicable to other areas besides just the corporate world or the workplace. I was being invited by Harvard Law School, for instance, to give a lecture on uh, Reinhold Niebuhr's The Nature and Destiny of Man. That has nothing to do really with the workplace, but the, the, the students studying to be lawyers saw it very much part of their workplace. Uh, and then of course, there were all the issues surrounding uh, the vaccines and, and misinformation and fear and, 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 and facts and faith and et cetera. So 
So that's now what I do. And it's almost identical to the other thing I did at Oxford. And that is I was a visiting fellow of the Oxford Center for Christianity and Culture. And one of the things that the Mockler Center can do that virtually no one else can do at Gordon Conwell or many other places is we can speak into the most important cultural issues of the day from a biblical perspective. And it is just such an honor and a joy to make come to life what the great Dutch polymath once said, and you'll recognize it when I say it, there is no place under the institution of God's providence that Jesus, who is sovereign over all, does not claim mine. And that's Abraham Kuyper who said that. And that's what we're trying to do at the Mockler Center. And that's what I try to do with all the courses I teach, is to bring every aspect of culture under the lordship of Christ, but also to allow culture to inform our thinking as well. It is not a one-way street. It is a dialogue between faith and culture. And that's the Kuyperian model. And that's what I tried to do. And that's how I got here. So just to give you an idea of what I'm reading like right now. So here's a book by Adam Kahane entitled Collaborating with the Enemy. How to work with people you don't agree with or like or trust. Fantastic book. I recommend it to you. Here's another one, The Economics of Neighborly Love. How do we ensure that we have not only compassion for the people who are less fortunate than ourselves, but the capacity to help them? Uh, here's another one, Stewards of Eden, Issues Surrounding Creation Care and the Environment. The evangelical church is way behind on this. We need to catch up because it's fundamentally important, in my opinion. How can we possibly love our neighbors as ourselves if we don't think about the damage we're doing to the earth we leave behind to the next generation? That's a Mockler Center issue. And then last but not least, Esau Macaulay's Reading While Black. What is a black hermeneutic? And why is it important for me? a white person to understand a black hermeneutic. Again, I would say it's because we can't possibly understand the interface of faith and culture from the perspective of our African-American brothers and sisters, unless we understand that hermeneutic. And so that is what we do at the Mockler Center. And I hope some of you or all of you will become students at the, at the seminary and, and take uh, some of the courses and get involved uh, in what we do. Here endeth the lesson. Fantastic. Um, well, thanks, Dr. Barnes. That was awesome. Um, so uh, going forward, this is, uh, we've got half an hour uh, to ask as many questions as we can think of. Uh, which is going to be great. Um, but uh, if you haven't been on one of these webinars, the way we do this is I will be moderating the questions. So if you would like to ask Dr. Barnes something, uh, shoot a message over to me in the chat. And then that way we can keep everything sort of uh, nice and level and um, avoid any sort of confusion or mix-ups. Um, so feel free to, to ask as many as you, you like, and we'll try and burn through them. Um, and Dr. Barnes, I, I was cracking up because um, I was in Dr. Pratico's last class that he taught. Is that right? <laughs> uh, and one of my favorite uh, Praticoisms was that when we were talking about our translations, um, if there was still sort of room that needed to be made and to be a little more specific he would his his polite way of saying that was that he'd kind of go well it's a little good newsy but i think you're there <laughs> yeah, a little good newsy you know one of the things i remember being taught by gary uh and i just spoke to him the other day still as sharp as attack by the way and 
He's writing his magnum opus, by the way. It's about a thousand pages long. He promised me he's going to shorten it before he publishes it. Um, you know, one of the things that he taught me, uh, and, and I've really never forgotten it, and that is that every translation is an interpretation. You, you cannot hide that. You cannot help that which is why we need to understand everyone's hermeneutic. Right. Um, okay, uh, we're gonna start with just a nice, a nice baseline question for you, Dr. Barnes. And that is, how would you recommend that a person establish themselves as a spiritual leader in their workplace? Yeah, good question. Well, first of all, let me just say that the sacred secular divide, uh, in my opinion, is bad theology. Um, it's all sacred to God. It's all sacred. You know, we've fallen victim to this notion that there's a secular realm and there's a spiritual realm. And that's, I don't see that anywhere in scripture. Uh, it's all sacred. It all belongs to God. And so I think first and foremost, it has to start with how we view our work to begin with, not just the workplace, but the work we do. In what way is it, uh, as Romans 12 implores us, how is our work our worship? So that's very important. How do we, how do we view what we do um, as part of that worship? But more importantly, how we do what we do as part of that worship? So the first way to approach Christian leadership in the workplace, I think, uh, is to understand that we are called to be salt and light in that workplace. That that workplace belongs to God, whether the people uh, who work there know it or not. Uh, and so we are called in many ways to be different from everybody else, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and not to be conformed by the ways of the workplace. So that's more than just not taking the paper clips. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's really thinking of how does what I do contribute to human flourishing? Because that's really what we're talking about. All economic activity is designed for human flourishing. Now it's victim to the fall, like everything else is victim to the fall. But if you take work to its most basic premise, it was designed by God at the beginning um, as part of the original command to go and subdue, go and multiply, go and et cetera, et cetera, uh, in order to create human flourishing. Uh, and to glorify God. So to me, it, you need to be really conscious of a good theology of work before you can even think about whether or not I'm being a good Christian leader in the workplace. Is my theology of work healthy? And that to me is the first step. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, while you're gaining those skills and that knowledge, just a ministry of presence um, is really important. Uh, to, be, to be someone that people can go to uh, and you will, um, you will listen to them and you will be as Christ-like to them as possible. And then lastly, prayer. And, and it may be last, it's not least. Um, the ability to transform a workplace through prayer is very, very important. Um, when, you, when you start seeing the people that you work with uh, as fellow sojourners uh, in this thing called life, uh, and you see them as brothers and sisters, whether or not they are saved yet, you don't know, uh, and you don't know what God's plan is for them, but you do know that they are a fellow human being created in the image of God, and Jesus died for them. Uh, and when you start looking at people that way, through that prism, uh, then it's very easy to love them, even when they're difficult, even when you disagree with them, even when you don't like them, even when you don't trust them, 
you can still work with them in a positive way. And that Christian witness very often is very powerful. I'll give you an example from my own life. Um, I was uh, a senior executive in a, in a corporation and uh, I had as my right-hand man a, a Muslim fellow. And he and I were at corporate headquarters and we were preparing some information for a, a very important international client with whom we were about to have dinner. And we were rushing around gathering all this information because we were running late. And I looked out of the window and I noticed that it was just about to go sundown. And I turned to this fellow and I said, let's stop what we're doing because I think you probably want to pray now. And he started to cry. He started to cry. He said, I've worked for this company for 25 years. You're the first person ever to do that. That is a powerful Christian witness, in my opinion, to show respect and love for people of other faiths people of no faith. And I don't know where that will go ultimately, but I know that it was a Christian thing to do. Hope that answered your question. That's great. Um, okay, here's, here's a fun one. Um, what would you say is, um, like what are, what are some, some great starting point uh, books for reading um, just to get a baseline perspective on how to sort of, um, how we should approach uh, workplace and, um, and existence as believers in, in the rest of the world. Um, and, and yeah, what are, what are the books you would highlight? Yeah, so that's a good question. There are, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of really good ones. Thank God it's Monday um, is, is a really good one. Um, uh, David Gill just came out with a new one. Um, I can't remember the title, forgive me. But uh, some of these resources are on the uh, uh, Macro Center website in terms of faith and economics, which includes an entire section on workplace theology. My last book, Redeeming Capitalism, uh, I think is, is, is a good one, uh, frankly. And don't just take it from me. <laughs> uh, it, it got pretty darn good reviews. Um, I think uh, Work in the Spirit by Miroslav Volf. It's been around 30 years now, but it's still a, a, a fantastic book. Uh, there, there, there are just so many of them. And, and if you go to the uh, theology of work or biblical theology of work, or workplace theology, whatever we call the course now, uh, on the Gordon Conwell website and look at the reading list, the assigned readings, any one and all of them are really, really good places to start to get an understanding of why it's so important. But, uh, but another one by, um, by my friend here, uh, Tom Nelson, who wrote The Economics of Neighborly Love, uh, he wrote another one a while back. I think it's referenced in here. I can't find it, but go to a website called Made to Flourish. That is a ministry that he runs, uh, which is specifically geared to church pastors. And they have a whole range of, of good references as well. There's lots of stuff out there. Tons of good stuff. Fantastic. Um, okay, here's a question. Um, can you speak to the uh, historic egregious behaviors that believers in the workplace have had and um, how we should be aware of them and weary of them? Yeah, so um, there's been a lot of bad theology for a long time uh, when it comes to faith and work. So let me address just a few that, that get up my nose. Um, one of them is this notion that, well, you know, what we do with our temporal lives is irrelevant because, you know, it's all going to burn up in the end. 
I'm sorry, you better have another reading. Uh, you better check your, your eschatology. Uh, because what it says is it's going to be renewed. Uh, and everything we do matters to God, including what we do in this so-called temporal existence. As Christians, we live in the already but not yet. That is an interim period where everything we do points toward the not yet. And so therefore it is judged by God as to whether or not it conforms to the values of the not yet. Uh, so a lot of the bad theology is too much driven by a, a predominant view of the fall. So work is cursed. And because work is cursed, um, you know, it's, it's a burden, it's a necessary evil. Again, that's bad theology. Look at what happens uh, in those passages early on in Genesis. Um, work is not cursed. Uh, work continues to be a blessing. Uh, the process is cursed because of the fall. But work itself is still intrinsically good because we are created by God in the image of God, who is himself the worker par excellence. Same with childbirth, right? Childbirth isn't cursed. The process is cursed. But procreation is a blessing from God. Why? Because we are created by God in the image of God, who is the ultimate creator, and we are co-creators through procreation. So think of work the way you think of procreation. It is a good thing. It is a gift. It brings value, lasting, eternal value to the kingdom, and it helps bring healing and flourishing and prosperity to the world. You know, in, in the last 15 years alone, economic activity around the world has lifted more than a billion people out of poverty. That is a good thing. And it's because of work and technology and economics. And, and if we avoid that fact, we, we simply lose sight of the fact that it is one of the arrows that God has put in our quiver to help alleviate pain and suffering and bring good news to the poor, as it were. So when, when, when Jesus speaks of the poor, he isn't just talking about the poor in spirit. He's also talking about people who are materially impoverished. Uh, and, and we need to remember that. So, so that's one of the, one of the uh, aberrations that I find particularly uh, disconcerting. Uh, another is this very pernicious belief, and it's very prevalent in evangelical circles, I'm afraid, that somehow God is a capitalist, or in more liberal circles, that God is a socialist. Well, I can tell you God is neither a capitalist nor a socialist. Uh, in fact, those terms mean absolutely nothing in terms of kingdom economics. And that's because uh, people view the world through such a narrow prism of their contemporary existence. When you read the scriptures, you see that economic activity happens both privately and collectively. There is a time and a place for the markets to do what the markets do in private free market economies, such as the one we tend to use in this country. And there are times when that is inefficient, and so we defer to the collective. So if you think about definitions of capitalism, for instance, and socialism, what is capitalism? Fact of the matter is, capitalism has no hypostasis at all. Capitalism, in fact, is a subject, not an object. Capitalism is just a term we use to describe the phenomenon of lightly regulated, highly monetized free market economies. We call that capitalism. And by the way, Karl Marx came up with the term. Free market economics work very well in most instances. But in order for a market to work efficiently, there needs to be a natural equilibrium between supply and demand. And the only mechanism for that in a free market is pricing. Now, the fact of the matter is, there are some things some commodities, 
some services that everybody needs irregardless of their ability to pay for them. For those things, we defer to the collective. Now, that's not socialism. It's, it's, it's simply deferring to a more efficient system of provision of goods and services. What is socialism? Socialism is the public ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. And guess what? Nobody in our economic system is even close to talking about real socialism. What they're talking about is what's sometimes called democratic socialism, where they want to expand the areas where the collective is involved. And so what we have to do is figure out where is the collective the most efficient and where are the markets the most efficient and stop taking sides. Because I can promise you, God is neither a capitalist nor a socialist. But what I believe God does demand of us is that we use the best system available to us in order to maximize human flourishing. And sometimes that'll be the collective. Most of the time, frankly, though, it will be through a free market system. That's the main driver of the last 15 years. But that doesn't preclude that there are times when the collective is more efficient. So those are two particularly uh, uh, egregious examples of people trying to pigeonhole uh, faith, work, and economics because they have their own preconceived notions. I say go back to the word, my brothers. Go back to the word. Sorry for the economics lesson. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, okay, I've got a ethical scenario for you, Dr. Barnes. Great. Uh, so um, here's 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 how it is is uh, presented. So imagine a CPA is doing corporate tax return for a small business. A uh, business owner has claimed various deductions in the past that are hyperbolic, uh, you know, in the least. Uh, an accountant, the accountant is uneasy about the pattern, but uh, their supervisor wants to keep the client happy. If the client is told that they owe new taxes, they'll probably leave and find a new firm uh, to check for their taxes. So assuming that the CPA firm is small and thus the impact of their, this client leaving is material, what sort of guidance do you have and how do they draw the line um, in this circumstance? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, when it comes to accounting, um, I would be very uncomfortable with uh, an accountant who exercises creative accounting because uh, that can land you in jail. Uh, not to mention it is obviously unethical. When it's the customer, however, the client, uh, whose practices are questionable, uh, the minimum you must do is ensure that they are within the law. That is the first thing. Now, that is not the high bar. That is the low bar, but it is a bar. The one thing you can never do uh, is turn a blind eye to illegal behavior. If someone is taking deductions which are just not legal, uh, then you have to speak out and say, these are not legal. I cannot certify your accounts, um, which of course accounts, that's, that's what accountants do, by the way. So understand, uh, accountants have a fiduciary relationship to shareholders. So the accountants who certify the books of a company are acting on behalf of all stakeholders, but primarily shareholders, not the executives of the business. Uh, so their job is to ensure uh, that the books are true and clean. Uh, now, and that also that the business is a going concern and that they can, they can vouch for that. So I would say if, if someone is pushing the envelope on their expenses, um, you do have to speak up. You do have to put your head above the parapet. And you have to say, look, um, I'm not going to tell you that you are operating outside the law here if you aren't. But I am going to tell you that if you're audited, the IRS may take a very different view. And that's an accountant's job. Accountant's job is to make sure the customer 
doesn't do anything that gets them into legal jeopardy. But yes, you have a moral obligation as well as a legal obligation to tell that customer that they are sailing very close to the wind and explain to them why it's not in their best interest to sail close to the wind. But I'll be honest with you, um, part of the problem is the tax code itself. The tax code itself is incredibly ambiguous in many places. Uh, this is gonna be played out in public with the Trump organization indictment that just came down. So I can tell you that, that as an expatriate executive working abroad, the very things that they have charged his chief financial officer with would have been perfectly legal. The company provides housing in London if you are a US citizen doing work at the London office. They pay for your children's education if you are working in London. That is all perfectly legal. But whether or not it's legal to do it when the person lives in New Jersey is a different story. And at the end of the day, the probability is that that will go beyond the reasonable person rule. And this, is a, this sounds like it's, it's not a legal concept, but it is. A legal concept is the reasonable observer rule. And if a reasonable observer would view something as egregious, then almost always the tax authorities will say that it went over the line. So it, I understand it's hard to tell a customer no ever, but at the end of the day, you've got to live with your own conscience. And when I say it's soul destroying, it is. I have been there. I know what it's like to compromise your morals for the sake of the business, even when you're doing something legal, but you know it's immoral. Sometimes you have to take a stand and say, I'm not going to be party to this or at least I'm gonna raise an objection. Let me give you an example from my own career in business. Two examples. One, I was asked to let go 100 people from a business that was doing very well. And I was being asked to do it because I knew that the vice chairman was gonna go on the conference call with the stock analysts he was going to tell them we, we had reduced our fixed costs in the European business by X millions of dollars in order to get a buy recommendation on the stock so he could exercise his options. Bingo. It was perfectly legal to lay off those 100 people. I objected to it. I objected to it on moral grounds. I still went through with it because it was my job. But I objected to it, and it started the process of me leaving the business. It wasn't overnight because I had obligations, but I had to ultimately leave the business for my own moral health. Now, guess what? My stock options went up too. So are my hands totally clean in this? No, I don't think they are. Even though I did nothing illegal, I had a moral crisis there. And what you want to avoid in these situations is a moral crisis. Why? because it's soul destroying. Another example, I was involved in a situation, an international situation, where a division in another country was doing something that I knew to be illegal, and I brought it to the attention of the board that it was illegal. I was overruled by the board. What do you do? And this is, this is where it gets sticky. On the one hand, you can just say, well, then I'm gonna leave. Or you can say, at least they know that I am gonna kick up a fuss every time I see this kind of behavior. So which is worse? To stay and be a party to it, but a conscientious objector and hopefully change the culture? Or to leave and then you leave the business world open to all the non-believers, and then there is no conscience in the business. There's no easy answer. Welcome to the world of ethics. Ethics is a world of gray, not black and white. That is a, that is a killer quote um, to, to bring us to a close here. That's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, 
Dr. Barnes, uh, we got three minutes left. Any, any final thoughts or statements you'd like to, to leave us with? Yes, come to Gordon-Conwell and bring your friends. Um, a theological education is the best education imaginable. Uh, if you speak to anyone in the academy, if you go to University of Chicago tomorrow and you ask anyone in the graduate schools, what's the most rigorous academic degree at the University of Chicago? They would say a divinity degree. Why? Because it requires the biblical languages for a reason. It requires a broad, broad appreciation for history, for philosophy, for ethics, for literature. I mean, it goes, it's not just Bible stories. It is the most rigorous degree imaginable, but it's also the most rewarding. And it makes you the most valuable person in your business, in your community, in your church. So do a degree and invite your friends to do one too, or to just take courses online. Because I'm telling you, if, if, the, if the wider business world required people to take business ethics courses at seminaries instead of business schools where they don't really teach ethics, they just teach compliance, those businesses would do much better and they'd be much healthier, believe me. Awesome. I love it. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us. And, thank you. Uh, yeah, this has been wonderful. And um, thank you, everybody that, that joined us. Sorry about the mix up, but uh, we're glad to have you. And um, for those of you that are watching us after the fact, thank you. And uh, we'll see you guys later. Stick around. Uh, we'll keep an eye out for next month.